this disciple swami vireshwaran ji maharaj and he received his monastic vows that means vows for sanyasa from revered swami gumbhiran ji maharaj besides mumbai from 1976 to 80 swami tagananda served in the monasteries at belurmot 1980 to 82 new delhi 1982 to 83 and chennai 1983 to 1997 and was sent to boston uh, in 1998 to assist swami sarvagotananda ji maharaj who was in charge of boston as well as uh, providence centers he is the hindu chaplain at harvard and mit since 1999 and after sarvagotananda ji is passing away or rather after retirement in 2002 he was appointed head of the vedanta society in boston tagananda was editor of the english journal vedanta keshari for 11 years like prabuddha bharat which we often know uh, read from that and also there is a parallel uh, magazine which is published it was established by swami vekananda and published from uh, chennai so he was editor of that magazine for 11 years from 1986 and 97 and has written translated and edited 14 books he is a prolific writer uh, though he has not written as such many books like swami chetanand ji but you will find many of his article in many magazines uh, uh, scattered uh, uh, in many places He writes a fortnightly blog, and his talks are available as a, as audio for podcasts. He has presented papers at academic conferences, and he gives lectures and classes at the Vedanta societies as well as at MIT, Harvard, and on invitation to other colleges and religious groups all over Northern America. And he is. few books that i told you one is looking deeply it is a vivek charmani of swami of sri shankaracharya and incidentally he has agreed to sign the books which he has written and which will be available in the bookstore so if you want to buy and get sign the books you are most welcome after the lecture to come to the bookstore the second book is walking the walk a karma yoga manual then third is a knowing the noor a gnana yoga manual a drop of nectar amrita bindu upanishad these are the books which i said that they, he has written in a sense that means uh, yes in a sense he has written and also he has edited many books that are also available so i am very happy to welcome swami tagarnand i know him since he joined actually so he, it is very nice meeting and uh, i welcome him to give his talk please come uh thank you thank you maharaj for that introduction i'm happy happy to be here <coughs> so the the topic is bringing god home the the pujas that we do and the, and the worship that we had uh, earlier today one of the ways the the characteristics of the worship that we have is um there are clearly many forms of worship in in different traditions and even within the vedanta tradition as well but one of the very endearing characteristic of the worship that we do is looking upon god looking upon the divine as a guest <coughs> we know that we may have seen a lot of youtube videos and and had zoom chats with people and they kind of become some part real in our heads but when we actually meet someone in person then they become even more real 
So personal direct contact with people makes them very real. And one of the things that as spiritual seekers we can ask ourselves is when we say, I believe in God, I have faith in God, uh, is how real God has become to me. The, we find the word God realization um, in the Gospel of Ramakrishna again and again and in Vedanta literature. What is the meaning of God realization? <coughs> and clearly, there's many different ways we can express that. But the way that uh, that I like personally very much is God realization is making God real. And we might discover that in our own heads, God, God is often a concept, an idea, something that we believe in, something that we hope is someone who is there. But unless and until we have had a direct experience of God, um, somehow that reality doesn't sink in. And so God realization would be a way to make God real. And the worship that we do when we invite God into our homes as a guest is a, is a ritualistic way of making the presence of God very real in our lives. And so a lot of the things that we do, and because this is a very ancient a tradition, the way the guests were invited may not exactly tally with the way we do today, but <clears throat> for instance, uh, in the elaborate forms of worship, the first thing that they do is um, cleaning and purification of the area where the worship is being done. And sometimes when we are expecting a VIP guest, we do clean our homes and clean everything and make sure that everything kind of looks uh, good and neat and tidy. And then in the, in the ritualistic worship, among the things that are offered, there is a, the seat is offered. And then one of the first things they do is um, offer water for washing the feet. Now, clearly, if a visitor has come from very far away and think about in ancient times, and then one of the first things they did was offer um, water for washing feet. And then you invite the guest in. You make them feel comfortable, give them flowers, and the way it's done ritually is to then feed them, give them fruit and food, and, and a way of honoring them is through, through waving of lights and so on. So the idea is we are not merely remembering God, not merely thinking about God, but actually feeling the presence of God right in front of us. Because we see that we need faith, we need belief, only as long as we have not had a direct experience. Now, when I, I look at this chair in front of me, I don't have to say, I have faith that the chair is there. I believe there is a chair. I don't have to say that because I just see the chair directly. But we still have to say, I have faith in God. I believe in God because we haven't had a direct experience of God yet, at least not me. I don't know if some amongst you may have had so. So that is what that was in my mind when I thought of the title "Bringing God Home." And since we are going to, you're going to celebrate here uh, next weekend the birthday of Krishna. Uh, what I would like to do is share with you a story uh, concerning Krishna, but which will highlight the significance of bringing God home. So this story is connected with the Krishna temple in northern India. Uh, it is a, it's a well-known temple there. It's in a place called Vrindavan, associated with many childhood incidents from Krishna's life. And that temple is called the, the Banke Bihari temple. Um, it was a temple, Sri Ramakrishna has visited the temple and it's, it's very well known and um, one of the tourist attraction, even if people who go there just out of curiosity when they visit these ancient temples. And of course, the devotees of Krishna uh, simply adore and love that place. But that temple is a little bit different from other temples. Now most temples, if you go 
and then you go and then on the altar there is the deity and then you bow and respect and, and pray to the deity. Uh, there is an altar there in that temple as well and there is Krishna on that altar. But the unusual thing in that temple is that separating the altar and the devotees, the congregation in the prayer hall is a curtain. <coughs> And that curtain is opened and closed throughout the day. As soon as the temple opens, they open the curtain, and in about a minute or a minute and a half, they just close it again. And then, then they open it again, and they close it again. It just goes throughout the day like that. And that's pretty unusual. You don't see that in many other temples. And so, obviously, the question would be, what, what is, why do they do that? Well, what is the significance of this closing and opening of the curtains? And as with many ancient temples in India, every temple has a story to tell <clears throat> of why certain things happened the way they are being done now. And so the story here is, is very interesting. Apparently, the the temple, when it was started sometime in the 15th or 16th century, it was like, a, just like other temples. There was nothing unusual about it. And quickly, it, was, it became very well known, partly because uh, if any of you have been there, uh, you might have seen it yourself. But nowadays, you don't even need to go there. Just, just go to Google and just put the name of the temple and you'll have hundreds of images, hundreds of pictures of that temple. So we can even visit that virtually. So the image there was, uh, sometimes they use the word swayambhu. It wasn't carved or sculpted by anyone. It was found. Uh, it was found uh, uh, in the uh, underground by a great saint named Haridas. And he was actually the his, his student became even more famous in history, and that was Tan Sen, the great, the great musician, the great singer. So his, his guru, Haridas, was a great saint, and he had found that image and was worshipping it himself, and later, after his passing, that image was put in that temple. And so because of that, that deity was considered an awakened deity. In other words, if people pray there, the prayers are answered very quickly. And so very quickly, a large number of pilgrims started visiting that temple. Now, as it happens, and some of you may have known about this, in many of these very popular temples where, which attract lots of crowds, there were a lot of shops outside selling flowers and garlands because then the pilgrims could buy them and make an offering inside the temple. So among the people selling garlands and flowers was one little girl. She was probably at that time nine or ten years old. She was an orphan. Uh, she lived by herself. And the only way uh, her father used to sell garlands and then when they passed on, that was the only thing new she knew. So she started selling garlands. She used to make beautiful garlands. And the temple authorities, the priests there, they needed 10 garlands every day for their worship. For the different rituals they did, they needed 10 garlands. And so they had given a contract to this girl to supply the temple with 10 garlands. And she would do, there's an, of course she would sell garlands and flowers to others as well. And she earned enough to, to maintain herself. Now this little girl was also a great devotee of Krishna. Now she had a great desire to go and garland the deity herself. Now as with many temples, not everyone had a direct access to the altar and to the deity. And so usually, um, fortunately or unfortunately, there's always somebody at the, as a gatekeeper. And so when the pilgrims brought things for offering, they had to give them in the hands of the priest. And the priest was the one who actually went and did that offering. 
If they brought garlands, they gave it to the priest. The priest is the one who went and put the garland. But this little girl, she hoped, she said, why can't I do it myself? I love Krishna. And it's the great desire of my heart to go and garland Krishna myself. But of course, system, it just doesn't work that way. So she, she thought, but she did one, one thing. What she did was, she, she was being paid for 10 garlands every day. So she said, I'm going to give them 11 garlands every day. They can, they can charge me for 10, but I'm going to give an extra garland every day as my offering. And her hope was that one day these priests will look at the number of garlands and say, we only order for 10. Why is she sending 11? And if they question me, then I'll tell them, that's, a, that's, that's my own personal offering. I'm not expecting to be paid for that 11 garland. And when they might see how devoted I am to Krishna, then they might say, would you like to come and garland him yourself? And so that was her hope. And so she went on supplying this extra garland every day, day after day after day after day. But priests, as oftentimes priests can be, they didn't even notice that extra garland. And so this girl kept on hoping that one day I might get a call, but it never happened. So after having doing this for weeks and months, then one day <clears throat> she was so overwhelmed with grief and this feeling that probably I'll never get a chance to go and garland Krishna myself. And so she went inside the prayer hall and stood in one corner uh, and then started praying to Krishna. And her, from the anguish of her heart, she prayed to Krishna and said, I've been giving this extra garland. You know how much I love you. You know how much I want to go and garland you myself. Sure, these priests haven't noticed it, but they're just human beings and human beings are fallible. But you, you know everything. So why can't you do something about it? And because she prayed so earnestly, it came from her heart. Suddenly she heard a voice, the voice of Krishna. And Krishna said, of course I know you have been sending this extra garland. I've been noticing it. I am completely aware of it. And then she said, if you're aware of it, why don't you do something about it? And then he said, you know, that's the problem. I'm not as free as you think I am. Because he said, it's the priests who decide when I should get up in the morning. It's the priests who decide when I will eat, how much I will eat. They decide when I should go to sleep. I don't have any freedom. And this girl is like, that's nonsense. I mean, you're supposed to be the creator of the whole universe. You run the whole place. And you don't have freedom. And he said, that's the reality behind it. But then she said, then what's the point? Um, can't you do anything? And he said, okay, I have a plan. Why don't you come in the evening, late in the evening, after the temple is closed? Then the priests have gone home no one's around here, and then you can do whatever you want. You have full freedom. And that time I'm also free because there's no gatekeepers here that time. And then she said, but the temple will be locked. And then Krishna said, oh, don't worry about that. I'll take care of it. You come in the evening after the temple is closed, and then, then you can do whatever you want. And so this girl was so happy, so excited. And so she goes home. She gets a nice basket, prepares a garland with fresh flowers and roses and, and she cooks some dishes for him. Everything that we would do for worship. And then night after the, the, everything is dark, the temple is closed, she gets one lantern in her hand. And those are pre-electricity days and it was very dark. So she got a lantern and then in the second hand she held a basket and then she came to the temple. And then, as soon as she touched the door, the door swung open. And she goes inside. And then 
the door to the sanctum also opened so she went still inside and she was so happy so excited she said she was just she felt like dancing immediately and she said now i can do whatever i want and thank you so much and so on but then krishna said wait a minute don't get so excited so quickly he said the problem now is this temple is supposed to be closed and and of course if you the only light you have in your hand a lantern <clears throat> if if you switch it off we can't see anything but if it's lighted people in the village brindavan was still a, it's no longer as small a village as as it seems now but that time it was still a very small village and so he said people in the village will see there is light in the temple they might think some thieves have come so it's not safe to do it here though your worship and everything better let us go to your place your home so she had this kind of a one small little cottage just towards the edge of the almost the end where the village boundary ends and he said let's go to your place and then no one will disturb us she said okay and he said you lead the way i'll follow you and so then this girl picked up a lantern picked up her puja stuff she started walking and krishna went behind her and then once they reached the girl's home they she opened the door they went inside he said close the door close all the windows make sure everything is latched and and then he sat on her bed and he said okay now you're free to worship and do whatever you want but then as she was about to begin krishna remembered something else he said okay just a minute he said the morning temple it's it opens at 6 o'clock i have to be back before that time because in the morning when the priests come and open and they find i am missing then there is going to be a problem so keep keep an eye on the on the clock because he said when i am with devotees i completely forget i lose the sense of time so i may forget so you and then she said but i am so happy that you are at home i will forget too and then they said okay they promised each other okay we both will try to be mindful of the time and and then and then she washed his feet and the way we do puja the way we do worship but she had the now the opportunity to not do the worship of krishna in an image or in or in a or in a photograph but krishna himself was right in front of her so she did the heart's content she did the puja she garlanded him her her lifelong ambition was finally fulfilled and then she fed him with the delicious sweets that she had prepared and then she sang and they danced together it was wonderful and time passed and they both forgot to look at the clock <laughs> suddenly they heard this loud knocking on the door open the door open the door and then they looked at the clock it was like 6:30 in the morning and then clearly it was the 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 priests had come and apparently it was the the rainy season so the 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 ground was wet and they had noticed these footprints going out of the door and that's how they were able to trace where the where krishna might have been taken and so they that's how they landed at that girl's cottage so as soon as they heard the knocking krishna said go open the door and she was afraid I mean, she just 10 year old little girl she said no 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 you open the door and krishna said it's your house it's it's not your. <laughs> and so and the, this little girl had to go and open the door as soon as she opened the door these three or four big tall burly priests the barged in where is the image where is krishna's image <clears throat> by that time krishna image is just kind of lying on the bed there and they found the image that here this girl stole the image from the temple and brought it here and this girl is like no i didn't steal him he himself came he just followed me he first said he asked me to come in the evening i went in the evening and they are like yeah 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 <laughs> the priest said i have been doing worship here for last 30 years he has not so much as blinked at me and you think he, you want me to believe that he talked with you he walked with you 
and my my before me my father worshiped here before that my grandfather nobody has ever seen heard krishna's voice or make move or anything and now you wanted to believe this story and the little girl kept on saying no please believe me this is what happened and anyway they couldn't argue with her a lot because the time was getting on and there would be a big scandal if the villagers came to know that the image was missing so the head priest he told his assistant now i will take care of the rest you take this image go quickly so far nobody has nobody in the village knows about this you go install the image do your morning worship and let's pretend things were as normal as before nobody need to know about this and after these priests had taken the image there and then this head priest looked at this little girl now this head priest was a sensible man he quickly realized that the image was just too heavy for this little girl to carry so although he found it incredible that krishna went he said well it's possible but this this little girl couldn't have done it and so he believed that yes it's possible that krishna did come here on his own but he then threatened that little girl he said i want you now to leave this village and go away from this place completely no we should not we don't want to hear from you again if you stay around here we are going to call the cops and you will be punished so and poor little girl she got so frightened she left the place immediately with her little belongings and no one ever heard of her again maybe she just became an enlightened being we don't know her what happened to her afterwards now these priests they came they installed the image back the worship continued the people came nobody other than these priests knew what had happened now that afternoon the the priests and the all the assistants they had a meeting and the head priest told these others you know however incredible the story looks i i tend to believe what that girl was saying i do believe that out of compassion krishna's heart melted and he he just he saw the devotee truly loving him that pure transparent devotion and then krishna went went to her place now the problem their problem was okay this girl was praying sincerely and krishna went to her place and now of course we have taken care of that she she no longer is will come to pray there what if some other devotee comes and prays with equal order and krishna's heart again melts and again he goes away and now luckily this time this little girl kind of stayed not too far away we were able to quickly go and bring the Im- image back what if let's say next time a devotee comes from sacramento or something <laughs> where will they come across the ocean to to get the the image back and so we have to do something about it and so that was the time they they got this brilliant brain wave they said let's put this curtain in the middle and so you you close the curtain krishna is not able to see anybody and and then a large throng of devotees gather there waiting for the curtain to be opened and then after 2 minutes they open the curtain and all that krishna sees is a large number of devotees and everyone is praying intensely and as soon as krishna tries to zero in on some particular person <laughs> they just close the curtain again so the idea was to prevent prevent krishna from running away not not answering the the prayers now and there is a lot that can be said about this story it's a, it's a it's a beautiful story but then we might say besides being an interesting story does it have any message for us what do we learn from this story and one one thing as i said that's how i began by speaking about worship because that's when we invite whoever is the object of our worship whichever deity we worship whichever form of the divine that we worship can we bring that divine in that form 
act in our home when we meditate when we pray we try to this is our home i mean there is an external home is where we stay the internal home is our own heart sri ram krishna often said that well god is everywhere but the presence of god can be felt more clearly more tangibly uh, in our own heart and that's why um, when we try to meditate we of course we try to why do we close our eyes why do we i mean one of the ways the, this can be expressed and in often vedanta texts they do it that way is our senses naturally go outward there is a beautiful passage in the katha upanishad um, which expresses this idea it goes like this paranch kahani vyatrnat swayambhu tasmat parang pashyati nantar atman kashchit dhiraha pratyak atmanam aikshat avrutta chakshuhu amrutatvam ichchan it's a, it's one of the often quoted passages from the upanishad and what it means is simply this that our senses the sense of sight sound all the 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 way we are in contact with the world all all of our senses are projected as going outward and that's why in order to see something we don't have to really make too much effort just open your eyes and then whatever is in front op- automatically shows up all the sounds around us if our ears are in working condition we just hear them so the senses are so experts in gathering sensory data from the external world and that's how we know what's happening around us the senses are not that great in telling us what's going on inside us because all of the consciousness is kind of going outward and if the truth is within if god is within then of course i don't see anything because all of my senses are taking me outside and that's why when we meditate we try to shut the senses as much as we can and therefore it's easier to meditate with eyes closed because when i close my eyes i'm shutting out the visuals as much as i can it's shutting down the mind is much more difficult but let's begin with trying to do what we can so we we close our eyes um we try as much as possible to sit in a quiet place or nowadays you don't have to do that if you have some good noise cancelling headphones mm, it's also helpful not to be eating or munching something when you are meditating so the taste sense of taste remains relatively inactive so also for instance while meditation sometimes they say not to wear too tight clothing because then your sense of touch can get uh, become active again so some loose clothing where you the idea is to kind of calm down the senses as much as we can and of course as i said calming down the mind is a much more tougher task but the idea is the more i try to shut down the doors which take me out into the external world the better chance i have of looking within it's almost like taking a u turn all these consciousness is going out i make it turn inside that's the third line in that verse avrutta chakshuhu the senses are closed and this is made to turn upon itself sri ram krishna gives the example and we can put it in modern uh, terminology today if you know extremely dark night with no lights around if all that i have is my flashlight in my hand then with the help of my flashlight i can see the road ahead of me but if someone is coming from the other side my light can help them see the road as well but they can't see my face because i'm behind the flashlight so if they have to see me if they want to know who i am they'll have to say could you please turn the light f- towards yourself so that i can see your face that's our situation because when we try to see god in our heart we 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 close our eyes we do all that we it's possible for us and yet beginning we, all that we see is darkness we see the darkness because somehow 
the light is still projected outside. We need a way to turn the light back towards ourselves. Now, very briefly, the just just a, a few few things that need to be said about the practice of meditation itself. Uh, there are many different ways of uh, expressing this idea, but one way is to distinguish between the practice of meditation and thinking. So thinking about God and meditating on God, are, are they one and the same? Oftentimes when we say, I'm now going to do meditation, what are we really doing? And I think for many of us, we are really thinking about God at that time. But is thinking itself meditation? So one of the ways this idea gets expressed is through the, the visual of, a, of a, an ocean, for instance. So we know that um, it, in, in the yoga, yoga sutras, the mind is often pictured as a lake. And we know that in a large bodies of water, um, the surface is always much more disturbed. You have, you have waves and you have ripples and it's much disturbed. But deep sea diving, those who have done, you know that as you go deeper and deeper inside the ocean, the water becomes more and more still. If you go down at the bottom of the Pacific or the Atlantic, it will be almost like a glass case. There is no movement there. All the movement is on top. Something similar happens um, in our own mind as well. It's on the surface level of the mind, there is all this disturbance going on. But the deeper we dive within, the mind becomes still, calm. And that's why there is this one Bengali song that Sri Ramakrishna used to sing often, that dive deep, dive deep within my mind. And so, the, 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 the example that comes to my mind is of, a, of sleep, for instance. Sometimes we say, I'm going to sleep now. When you're tired, you had your dinner, and then you say, I'm going to sleep. We make it appear as if sleep is something that we can do. It's in our own hands. It's in our own uh, capacity to do. Actually, no. We cannot will ourselves into sleep. So when we say, I'm now going to sleep, what we are actually going to do is what most of us do. We go to our room, make sure our bed and everything is comfortable, switch off the light, and then, and then lie and just wait. There's nothing you can do beyond that. Um, and then at some point, sleep happens. So sleep is not something that can be done. Sleep is something that happens. All that I can do is make the conditions as favorable as possible for sleep to happen. In exactly the same way, meditation is something that happens. Meditation is not thinking about God. Meditation is actually seeing God. And that's, that's what brings me back to what I said before. It's like if my, if my friend is far away, if, let's say if my friend, friend is staying in New York, and then, of course, nowadays you can still do video chat and all of that. But other than that, I can think about my friend because my friend is far away. But let's say if my friend is visiting me and we are sitting across the table sharing a cup of tea or coffee, I, can't, I don't say, let's close our eyes and think about each other. <laughs> we don't do that because my, the friend is right in front of me. Why should I think about my friend? I can just see my friend. And so when I say, when we say that, God is everywhere, and isn't that a paradoxical thing? If God is everywhere and we see God nowhere, how come someone who is everywhere can't be seen anywhere? If I truly believe that God is in my heart, God is right here, then why do I have to think about God? Why can't I see God? And therefore, there is a difference between thinking and seeing. So when we close our eyes, try to dive, turn our attention to the heart 
and yet don't see God or don't see God in whichever form in our Ishta your chosen ideal chosen deity you don't see the divine in that form then the next best thing we can do is to think about God now thinking has this great power so to speak that when my thinking becomes one pointed with no no distraction of any kind then at some point thinking stops on its own and seeing begins just like when we are going to sleep we switch off the lights we lie down maybe turn or twist a little bit here and there and then at some point sleep happens exactly in the same way we close our eyes if we see God right away then you are blessed if you don't then think about God think about God so intensely and that's why oftentimes in many kinds of meditation what helps is a visual what helps is a sound so since we deal with forms all the time that's what we are trained to do that's what the mind and the eyes and senses do all that we say is instead of saying get rid of all forms get rid of all things it's easy to say it's very difficult to put it into practice and so what we can train our mind to do is instead of flitting from one form to another for the next few minutes, just hold on to one form, the form of your chosen ideal. Instead of getting distracted by hundreds of different sounds, just hold on to the one sound, the sound of your mantra. And so that's one way of calming the mind down, that you are asking the mind to hold on to just one form and one sound. And that already, to the extent the mind succeeds in doing so, it already calms down quite a lot. Now this form and this sound that we have given the mind, because it is so powerful, because it is a divine origin, just like in sleep, uh, the turning and twisting ends and suddenly sleep starts, in the same way, this is still a thinking process when you're holding on to a form, holding on to a sound. In Sanskrit they say it's a manasa vyapara. It's still an activity of the mind. But at some point, because of the power embedded in the form and the sound, thinking stops on its own. And it stops on its own and then seeing begins. When exactly it happens, how exactly it happens, no one can say for sure. What we do know, it does happen. And that's when the divine in our heart is no longer someone to be believed in, no longer someone in which we need to have faith, with someone who is very real. Now what is the... How real is the divine in our heart? Is the, are there gradations in reality? And probably, yes, that might be the way our human mind thinks. When we see dreams at night, as long as we are seeing them, they seem very real. But then when we wake up, they say, oh, now I'm finally, this is the real, real. And that's just a dream. So in our way of thinking, we do ascribe a, a higher, greater reality to this world that we are than the reality that we saw in our dream last night. So just as this waking world seems more real than the dream world, the real that I see in my heart is even more real than this waking world. Compared to the reality of the divine that we see in our heart, compared to that, even this world appears less real, is almost like a dream. Now, many devotees who have done their practice in the way that their teachers have taught them, done that with faith, with regularity, with devotion, day after day, day after day, 
without getting discouraged sometime or the other they have had that experience they have seen the divine in their heart and even if any amongst us have not seen that we have hope that yes if someone has seen then i can see it too because that was one of the great teachings of sri ram krishna he didn't say i have seen when narendra nath as vivekananda young vivekananda went and asked him have you seen god ramakrishna didn't say yes i have seen god now you just keep on worshiping me he didn't say that what he said was yes i have seen god you can see him too and that's not something he told only narendra nath that's something that ramakrishna is telling every one of us every one of us has that potential has that capacity right now right at this moment to experience the presence of god in our heart all that we need to do is to do the just follow the instructions of whatever guide or teacher we have had in our life now those who have had this experience find that the experience itself doesn't last too long yes it's it's very profound it's 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 a game changer it can change our life it can transform our life but the experience itself is often short lived so you 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 see god in the heart and then afterwards something happens and it just it's almost like the curtain gets closed sri ram krishna gives another example when you have a a pool of with stagnant water and sometimes this moss and algae will get cover that thing and then you just kind of move it a little bit and then below you see clear transparent water underneath but then you just stand by after some time all that algae and this thing come and cover it up again now that's what happens in our lives also even when we are lucky and fortunate and recipient of that grace of god in the form of this direct experience of the divine in our heart then after that experience ends because of our all past accumulated desires and ambitions and still the heart not having been completely transparent yet somehow it just comes and covers that it as if this curtain has closed again so that's how that's how we relate to the story of krishna that i mentioned before there is already this opening of the closing of the curtain happening in our lives so the first time the curtain opens in our heart it's an amazing experience but when the curtain closes and just because when you had this first taste of it it can be even more frustrating in some ways because you want it to open again it's a little bit like um, for instance just to give an example it's no longer true but but well, before i came to this country i had never tasted tiramisu i didn't know about it in india and so the first time i came and somebody brought it a dessert and it was so delicious and i said what is this what is it called they said oh this is tiramisu i said oh this is great now before i had never eaten it i never missed it because i didn't even know it existed but now after eating the first time then i said oh when will that next time i have the same tiramisu for dessert now that's what happens when the first time the curtain opens the first time you are able to see not just feel but see the divine in your heart and then the curtain closes again it's like when will it open again and and that's a good thing that kind of a frustration is so much better than frustration related to things the perishable things of the world swami brahmananda in that book the, the eternal companion in fact encourages he says cultivate divine discontent so often the people say be contented be happy okay be happy then you don't need to do anything so yes be happy with things over which you have no control but this is something it we have to be extremely unhappy that we have under realized god we see that in the life of ramakrishna himself that he was so in the beginning so intensely looking for the vision to see whether the divine mother he was worshiping was she real he wanted to see her he would rub his face in the ground it was like you, maybe you don't have to do that but but we see how extreme his case was at the end of the day he would say one more day has passed 
and I have not had a vision of the mother. And so that intensity, finally, when he had that vision. We see that in the case of Swami Vivekananda as well. When he had this first experience of Nirviklap Samadhi through the grace of his guru in, in, in Kashipur in 1886. And then, of course, it was a profound experience, as one can imagine. But when it ended, he was restless. He wanted, he wanted it to continue. He didn't want it to end. And then Ramakrishna said, okay, I'm not locking it up because you have a lot of work to do. And you can imagine it must have been even so much more frustrating for him. He tried throughout the, the short life that still remained for him to work and move amongst us to, to get that experience again. And we do have uh, some three or four at least recorded instances when through the grace of Ramakrishna, he, he had glimpses of that again. The curtain did open for him again. Until at last, finally, in 1902, July 4th, the curtain opened once and for all. So that's what even you and I, when we continue with our spiritual practices, we will see the similar phenomenon occurring within our own hearts. We'll see the curtain, the first time it opens, it'll be wonderful. Keep on, and then we will see if I do that, maybe, maybe after a few days, maybe a few weeks, could be months, we just have to be patient. Then the curtain will open again. The, the more it often, the more, the more often the curtain opens, my, my faith will deepen, my intensity of practice will increase, and over time, what we will see is that the the gaps between the opening of the curtain will become less and less and less. And once the curtain is open, it will remain open for a longer time. And then who are these enlightened beings? Who are those spiritually illumined ones? They are the ones in whose heart the curtain has gone completely. It never closes. So that's, that's the struggle going forward. Not simply to think of God, not simply to believe in God, but the goal is to see God. That's why in the teachings of Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Swamiji, we see that religion is not simply about believing in things, not simply acknowledging things, but actually experiencing. That's why they said religion is realization. And I don't know how etymologically right or appropriate it is, but realization, whenever I heard the word realization, I think making it real. Only when I see God, God will become real to me. And when God becomes real, so when you enter, when you enter the shrine, when you come here, you're then no longer standing before the image or a photograph or this thing. You're standing in the presence. So it's not simply a picture of Ramakrishna, a picture of Holy Mother. They are there in reality. So that's, that's what I mean by be, the, just as when we meet our friends, we see the friend standing in front of me is real, that's the kind of realization we need when we go inside a temple that before me on the altar is real, God who is real. Because oftentimes we think that when I go to a temple, I will have darshan. I'm going to see the, the deity on the altar. What many of us don't think or don't remember that just as I am seeing the divine, God is seeing me too. So it's not simply I'm having darshan, God is having my darshan, if we don't like to think about it that way. But it's good to remember. People speak about the big brother watching. Nobody wants the government to be watching and intruding into your privacy. But think about the divine who is watching us all the time. It's extremely, it might be uncomfortable to know that God is watching me all the time. But, but, and this is important, remembering that I'm never really alone, that nobody in the world might know or see me if I'm just closed in my own room, but God is already there. And remembering that God is always watching me, God is always seeing me, God is always hearing me, we will make fewer mistakes in life. We will make better choices in life if we remember 
that we are always in the presence of God. And if we continue in this way, a day will come when the curtains will open for the first time, the curtain will keep on opening with greater frequency and one day the curtain will open and never close again. Then we can say, truly God will have come to our home and we are going to then keep him there and not let him go anywhere. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohum. Namaste Swamiji. My name is Pushya. Uh, how do you know the first time when the curtain has opened? Oh, you will know. <laughs> you will know. If you, if you have a doubt, that means it has not opened. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Maharaj, when you say uh, you stop thinking and seeing begins, so that's actually feeling the presence of God. You're no longer feeling it, you're seeing it, seeing God. But that's also, I mean, internally seeing, but not with these eyes. Not in? Not with these eyes. No, your eyes are closed, you're meditating, right? Yes, you're seeing it. And we're seeing it internally. The, the, the beauty of that inner seeing is that once you see, that appears much more real. That reality, it's like a much higher resolution of what we see, then this world will appear like a pictures with low resolution. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Would you speak to the role of talking to God and how that uh, is actually confirming your belief in God and perhaps drawing God nearer to you. I think th in the gospel, of course, Ramakrishna talks a lot to, to yeah. Yes. Uh, but I don't recall too many other examples of that in this tradition. Yes, yes. Ta talking to God is v connected with the reality of God. That's why sometimes even when we are speaking with someone over the phone and if I'm the one doing all the talking and I don't hear any kind of a response from the other side, then it's like, are you there? We just say, you know, it's like, uh, and so prayer is prayer for prayer to become real and talking to God is a kind of prayer before we, before we actually begin seeing God. So that prayer requires faith because it's almost like having a phone conversation with God and oftentimes not hearing anything back, but just still having that full faith that God is on the other line, still listening to what I'm saying. That's first thing about prayer. The second thing about prayer is when we often say that prayers are answered or not answered, and I believe that every prayer is answered. The reason I say that is, oftentimes we say, if I ask for something and God gives it to me, then my prayer is answered. And if God doesn't give it to me, my prayer is not answered. No, if God doesn't give it to me, the answer was no. <laughs> so, so, and I, I'm, I think we have to be really grateful. It's an act of God's love and God's grace for us that most of our prayers are not answered. <laughs> Because really, we, we, don't, we don't know, honestly, we don't know what's good for us. Oftentimes, something that we ask for, in retrospect, it turns out, no, that was not good for me. And so, so yes, so talking to God would require faith that God is real. And the more that 
that faith is, the more effective the prayer becomes. And it can be a dialogue, so to speak, not just a request or asking God for something. Well, in the beginning, it will be almost like a monologue because dialogue will be when I hear God saying something, right? So if God is infinite consciousness bliss, and that's what we are, not the name and the form, but consciousness itself, which appears as all these forms, why do we talk about God as something outside of ourselves? Well, we don't have to. One should feel free to talk about God in whichever way it comes naturally to them. I don't think anyone has any business telling anybody how they should think about God. So, I mean, but, you know, sometimes we tend to think, oh, saying God is infinite eternal consciousness, that's like an accurate description of God. It's not. There's no accurate description of God. God cannot be described. So, we are trying to describe the indescribable. We're trying to express what essentially cannot be expressed. And therefore, no description, no way of thinking of God is ever going to be perfect. And so, whichever way of thinking of God resonates with one's own head and heart, whichever way, people are different. One way of thinking might make sense to someone, it may make, make no sense to someone else, but that's good. Luckily for us, there is not just one way of thinking of God. There are many different ways we can do so, and every way is good to the extent that it can take me face to face with God. So ultimate goal is, to see the divine, to directly experience the divine. And whichever way works, go ahead with it. So that's how I see it. Yeah. yeah. Namaste Swamiji. Uh, I wanted a little bit clarification on when you talked about when you are imagining or you're doing the meditation and you have the image of the Ishta Devata or whatever your the object of your meditation, you said something about uh, which kind of differentiates just meditating on any object versus mm -hmm. the Ishta. And you said that because of the, uh, the greatness or something like that, mm -hmm. that's why. Sure. So can you clarify or yeah, speak the, a little bit about the, that? I mean, for instance, meditating on a chair and then meditating on a divine form will will yield different results so the the the, the forms of the divine or the uh, whether in the form of a symbol or or, a, or whichever way one pictures it has an intrinsically more power than than any of these perishable objects we see around us similarly uh, words i mean a mantra is a collection of words but the mantra has embedded in it some power which may not be there in any other. So it's not like you just at random pick up some sentence and keep on repeating that. It may not yield the same result. So there is something special about a mantra, something special about the visuals, um, divine visuals that people use for meditating. Maharaj. So how does one deepen the faith that even if you are not seeing that curtain opening hmm. for days and months and years, how do you keep doing it? <clears throat> I believe that this deep faith is present in all of us, but it may not manifest to the same extent in every person because of other obstructions coming in the way. And those other obstructions would involve could include um, my outgoing tendencies, my desires, the way my mind goes behind this perishable reality. The more I'm able to curb that, the more I'm able to use my willpower to direct it in a direction I want it to go, the more I'm able to practice discernment, um, the obstacles will go away. And the more these obstacles go away, 
the, the, the inherent faith already present in me will begin to manifest more and more. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 I thank Swami Tagananda for his beautiful and very touching talk about bringing God home. We learned many things from his talk and hopefully some of the tips, ideas that he had given, we shall be able to make into our practice. As I told you earlier, he will be available in the bookstore to sign his books which are there, like Looking Deeply, Vivek Churamuni, that is a book on Vivek Churamuni, then Walking the Walk, Knowing the Knower and a Drop of Nectar. 